uh, with me leading it, and then we'll do a separate one in small groups. Um, so, uh, so first let's uh, talk about the northern and southern kingdom. So I'm not going to try to draw a map of Palestine. I'm just going to draw. Uh, it's a rectangle. <laughs> I'm just going to kind of draw a big circle. So let's, uh, so the kingdom is split basically in the middle. You have a united kingdom until about 930. This is BCE. Um, and then after Solomon dies, dies the, kingdom, the kingdom divides. Jerusalem would be about right here, just in the northern part of the southern kingdom. The southern kingdom is the kingdom of Judah. Now, I think sometimes these terms are confusing because the northern kingdom is the kingdom of Israel. In the kingdom of Israel, you have the ten, ten tribes. This is also where uh, Galilee is. So that's where our Lord is from. Um, and then in the southern kingdom, you have the tribes of Judah and Benjamin. And mostly, the reason I say around 10 is because you also have most of the Levites are here too. But the Levites were the only group that was not given land. They, they were given certain cities, and they, they were the priestly tribe. So they lived mostly among the, in the southern kingdom. Though you had, there's evidence that they were up here too. So um, these are the two kingdoms. And the idea is, so, so there are two, there's two working theories, right? So one is that the people that became the Israelites, which we should include, this is, this is why the terms are confusing, we should include all these people, or the Hebrews, might be a better term, people who were speaking Hebrew, who were worshiping a God called Yahweh, who were sacrificing to him, who were reading the same sort of oral tradition, uh, texts that they were already writing, being written down. All of these people, one theory is that they were slaves in Egypt and they came out of Egypt, follows the biblical narrative, right? Another theory, though, is that maybe it's a group of people which merged with slaves that came out of Egypt, and maybe it's a group of people that grew up out of Canaanite religions. So we have evidence of communities in Cana where you can't find, for example, any pig bones in the communities. So we know there were groups of people in ancient Cana who also seem to which is really strange, because there would have been ton, tons of, uh, of pigs in the, in the region. So we know there are communities in Cana who weren't necessarily worshiping Yahweh, but also had some of the some similar um, uh, dietary practices. So depending on sort of where the, where the narrative, which, which narrative we go with, the point is that these two kingdoms have different stories. They have different focuses. And at least by 930, um, well before this, at least by probably, I don't know, 1100, we can pretty much say that these are the Hebrews, they're worshiping the same God, they have the same world tradition, but two different sort of traditions are coming out of here, right? So you've got the Yahweh's writer, the J, down here, you probably have the P, priestly writer. Up here you have more of a focus of the Elohim's writer. Um, and the Deuteronomist, uh, I don't know where people put it. it I, guess, I guess it's mostly down here. Um, uh, so, the, so I wanted to flesh that out a little bit because I think what's really important about this, the reason it's important, is because this is also an example of who gets to tell the tradition, right? So in the 730s, this kingdom, the northern kingdom, the kingdom of Israel, lasted until about 723 when the Assyrians sacked the northern kingdom. 
So the Assyrians came in and they just wiped it out. It was gone. Um, and it's unclear what happened. Were these people taken into exile? Were it's just really unclear about what, what happened to their kingdom. Did they come into the southern kingdom? Um, um, and so at some point you had just the southern kingdom until about five. <coughs> Until about 580, there about. I'm rounding off numbers because I can't remember the exact numbers, but to about 580 when the, uh, when the Persians sacked the southern kingdom um, and the people are taken into exile and then returned. Um, they returned in five, five points. Uh, they're only there for, for about 50 years in Persia. So, this is the group that remains. This is the group that becomes what, that eventually grows into the second temple period, what really becomes what we would call today Judaism, the Jews. This is, this is the, after they return from exile, this is the kingdom that gets to tell the narrative. So the reason this is important, the reason source criticism is important, is because it traces back to see sort of who's telling the narrative. Who, get, who, gets, to, who gets to tell the So for example, the Isaiah thing, don't sacrifice at the high and holy places. We know that the kingdom of, in the kingdom of Judah, the Yahweh cult, or the Yahweh rituals for sacrificing the Yahweh were all centered in Jerusalem. At least it appears that way. They were all centered in Jerusalem, on the Temple Mount, in the temple, in the first temple, Solomon's temple. Up here, it may have been on Mount Oram, it may have been over here, it may have been over here, there's one in Bethsaida. They were sacrificing all over the place to the same God and doing the same stuff, they were sacrificing all over the place. And so the narrative is, if Isaiah is saying, you have to sacrifice in Jerusalem, Jerusalem is the place that you sacrifice, in fact, Yahweh won't even acknowledge your sacrifice unless it's in Jerusalem, then why is Isaiah saying that? Because these people up here are sacrificing in other places. Right? So it's, it's also, these, this is important because it also shows, what's the power dynamic? Um, did Jerusalem have, you know, was Jerusalem, was that where the wealthy and the elite are. Is that where the scribes are? Um, uh, there's also some kinks in this because we know that there is a temple found in the second temple period in the northern kingdom. Also, when I was in Jerusalem last year, as I was leaving, just as I was leaving, they had just discovered two miles from the temple mount a temple from the early temple second period, we're talking 500s, uh, that appeared to be a Yahwehist Jewish temple. So just two miles from Temple Mount, there were people sacrificing somewhere else to Yahweh. So obviously there's a lot of variety. There's some, something is going on. The narrative isn't as cut and dry. That's why this is important. Does that, does that make sense? Are there any questions about that? We'll look at Abraham and Moses here in just a second. Okay. So, uh, let's look at <clears throat> Genesis 17. I'd like to ask someone to read from... Genesis 17, 1 to 1 through 14. Anybody want to volunteer? 17, 1 through 14? Yeah. When Abraham was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to Abram, Abram and said to him, I am El Shaddai. Walk with me and be trustworthy. I will make a covenant between us, and I will give you many, many descendants. Abram fell on his face, and God said to him, But me, my covenant is with you. You will be the ancestor of many nations. And because I have made you the ancestor of many nations, your name will no longer be Abram, but Abraham. I will make you very fertile. I will produce nations from you, and kings will come from you. I will set up my covenant with you and your descendants after you in every generation as an enduring covenant. I will be your God and your descendants God after you. I will give you and your descendants the land in which uh, you are immigrants, 
the whole land of Canaan as an enduring possession, and I will be their God. That's good. Thank you. That's great. All right. And now let's turn to Exodus 19, which is on page 73. We're all using the same Bible. household and declare to the Israelites, you saw what I did to the Egyptians and how I lifted you up on eagles' wings and brought you to me. So now, if you faithfully obey me and stay true to my covenant, you will be my most precious possession out of all the people, since the whole earth belongs to me. You'll, you will be a kingdom of priests for me and a holy nation. These are the words you should stay, say to the Israelites. Keep going. Yeah, that's great. So, what are the differences that we see between the story? Or what do they have in common, too? If we're talking about source, source criticism, the JEEP. God bless them both. One thing I noticed off the bat is they both use Yahweh, right? Or appear to. I don't have the, the Bible in Hebrew with me, but it, the CEB uses Lord. So they both use Yahweh. So both of these stories, at least in some respect, come out of this southern kingdom. Other things? What, what is, what's different? What does God ask Abraham to do? I mean, if we kept reading, God does say, mark the covenant with circumcision, right? Other than that, he really doesn't tell him to do anything. He just says, here. This is what I'm giving you. And Moses, he says, if you do this, then I'm going to do this. Okay. Right, so unconditional? Mm -hmm. This is conditional on obeying, on obedience. Anything else? So this is really the same thing we did earlier, but I just wanted to flesh this out a little bit because this is the Zion Covenant, or what is called, commonly called that and the Sinai Covenant. Um, and so this is another idea of, right, we have sort of two seemingly conflicting images of what God's requiring here. Um, um, and it's, it's, all, it's, all about the, it's all about the sources. Um, what, yeah, did you have a question or anything? So what is this? Um, so if we're if we're doing this if we're doing an exegesis, one of the things that you would always do as an exegesis is, what does this say about God? Or how? So for example, you always do an exegesis if you're writing a sermon. At least I do. Try to at least do a small one. If you're writing a sermon on a particular text, you want to look at the text. What does it say about God? What does it say about God for me now? What does it say about God for the community? For my community? What what are these two different ideas of covenant? What does it, what does it have to say about God? Think about your own life your own community, or our world. Does 
There's no wrong answer. I don't have a, a question, an answer in mind. Just curious what you think. God blesses. God blesses. God will um, ask you to do something not based on your ability, but his ability. Our faithfulness towards God, even when we fail, right? And, but God's faithfulness towards us, too. Right? And grace. I mean, I see grace in all of this. All right. I think that's, that's pretty good. And let's, uh, let's go ahead and do real quickly what I wanted to do in the first section about sort of going through the Torah very quickly, sort of key themes you want for each book of the Torah. And then we will um, go into the Walk and one thing, and then we'll actually do our exegesis. <laughs> um, so... So for Genesis, um, the very first book of the Bible is in some ways both universal and specific. In some ways it, it deals with the Hebrew people, it deals with Israel, in other ways it's about the earth and humanity and humankind. Um, so it easily divides sort of into two sections. Chapters 1 through 11 and chapters 12 through 15. Um, chapters 1 through 11 are sort of the primeval or primordial history. Um, so if we're dividing it, chapters 1 through 11, 12 through 15. Um, and um, in this section, in chapters 1 through 11, are the accounts of creation of the world, the creation of humanity, the story of the flood, the confusion of languages and the dispersement of people. The stories are mythic in proportion, and they speak to sort of universal realities. Um, chapters 12 through 50 represent a shift from the origins of the world to the beginnings of the people. Um, so the themes, instead of giving you an outline, let's just go through some of the themes so we can move through each book pretty quickly. Um, creation of humanity in God's image. Creation and establishment of order by separation, setting the limits. Creation by order. Um, humanity chooses to disobey God. God is always attempting to hold on to humanity despite sin. Um, humanity's increased separation from each other and from God.
and uh, God's promise to Abraham, and the ancestors wrestling with blessing. I know my handwriting just keeps getting worse and worse. Uh, so those are sort of, I think, key themes from, from Genesis, just to understand. What was the last one? Uh, the ancestors wrestling with the blessing, okay. trying to understand it. What does it mean to them? What does it mean to them? Exodus. So this one's important because it's sort of the centerpiece of modern Judaism um, and ancient Judaism. It's the. It's also uh, for Christians a major theme in understanding the Paschal mystery and Christ's death and resurrection and what it means to be connected to this this Jewish tradition as well. Um, so uh, Exodus marks uh, the birth of the nation of Israel um, and God's deliverance of, of the people from, from bondage in Egypt. It's the ultimate expression of divine power. Um, and in some ways, we can understand the law, which we'll get to in a minute, uh, 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 a minute if I can speak, in Leviticus, one, we can begin to understand the law as a response to slavery. Right? So... Sometimes we look at the law and we see the law as, um, for example, some of the laws around uh, women's bodies. And we say, what? A woman can't be, you know, um, touched after childbirth for, I don't know how, ever many ridiculous days. Um, but if you understand it as a people coming out of slavery where they didn't even own their own bodies, their own bodies didn't belong to them. A woman being allowed the rest after childbirth and not being put to work and being allowed to rest after childbirth is, is actually grace. The law in some ways is a response to slavery. It's a response to the creation of a new people, a free people. Um, so we always have to remember that when we're, when we're reading the law and reading it in the context of the history of the people. Um, so in the first section of the book, of the book of, uh, Moses emerges as an unlikely leader, right, against the backdrop of the Israelite suffering. We've all seen the Prince of Egypt. <laughs> 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 oh, we miss Whitney Houston. Um, Moses is reluctant and often frustrated as a leader, um, but uh, God manages to work through Moses, um, uh, who becomes the greatest prophet. Um, um, and Aaron, Moses' brother and spokesperson, is chosen along with his sons to serve as priests uh, for the people. And Aaron's descendants, the Aaronites, claim descent from Levi through Aaron. Um, you also have the struggle between deities. God and Pharaoh culminates in the slaying of the firstborn. Um, uh, in chapter 15, 22, we have the beginning of the wilderness and legal traditions, which comprise the majority of the book. So the Israelites were redeemed by God and now belong to God. It's during the wilderness period that Israel must learn what is involved in serving God. Um, so, uh, no, I'll save that for Bruno. But let's cover key things. All right? Connection to... So Exodus shows a connection to the patriarchs and their narratives. Um, and it's a, also a fulfillment of promised ancestors. Um, it's uh, the revelation of the divine name, even though it appears in other in Genesis, but the revelation of the divine name. Um, at Mount 
in Sinai. Um, God as the true God. God as deliverer, redeemer, uh, God as lawgiver. Prophet as spokesperson for God. themes of wilderness. Um, law as central to relationship with God. And women as modeling deliverance. So you have Pharaoh's daughter, and midwives, and Zipporah. Um, I, I think these two are the most important to sort of give outlines and walk through. And so I'll quickly just talk about Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. We're not going to write them on the board because I'm afraid we're going to run out of time, and I really want us to get to the two, the two other things that I wanted to do. Um, so Leviticus, right, is sort of taking this law that's given in Exodus and, and, and codifying it so you have laws of, sac of sacrifice, dedication of the tabernacle and the ordination of priests, dietary laws, also defilement, purification, the Day of Atonement. You know, if you've ever read Leviticus, you'll, you'll see all this stuff. Um, um, in uh, Numbers, um, Numbers takes us up for the narrative and Exodus left off. Right, so Leviticus is almost like uh, we get this law, but we don't really know what it is. And so Leviticus kind of gets plopped in. It's like, oh, here it is. And then Numbers is like, okay, now let's pick up with the story. Um, so Exodus ends with the, um, the creation of the, of the tabernacle. On, um, and uh, Numbers um, uh, so the children of Israel are struggling with God and themselves and how to prepare to leave a life in the wilderness. For the promised land. So Numbers uh, takes over that theme. So some of the themes in Numbers are you have an overarching theme in the book um, of death of the old and birth of the new. Um, the continuation of desert themes. Um, the harsh environment is the testing grounds for Yahweh's people. Um, and it's in the environment of the desert that the old generation dies. But God's covenant is still valid. God's uh, providence and protection and presence with the people continue. Um, and so, and then Deuteronomy begins with a long sort of narrative sermon that is delivered at the last stage of Israel's journey in the wilderness. In the last book of the Torah, it provides, Deuteronomy provides a conclusion to the first division of the Bible, while it introduces the second division of the Bible, the prophets. Deuteronomy is the link between the two divisions. In Deuteronomy, uh, we, have, we see Israel's history and, and, uh, and a series of commands, including those to hear, listen, and remember. And so sort of the key themes are covenant is central to Israel's identity, covenant is conditional in Deuteronomy, and blessings and curses are a direct result of obedience and disobedience to the law. So... I want to stick with Exodus for a minute because I think it's a good transition to this Walter Brueggemann thing about narrative. So we talked earlier about how the people of Israel got into Exodus in the, in the, to begin with, right? They sold their bodies because they were starving. So Brueggemann argues that there exists in our world a totalizing narrative. Brueggemann 
and is retired. He's a Disciples of Christ minister or United Church, United Church of Christ. Uh, but he is a retired professor of Old Testament um, from uh, Columbia, um, which is in South Carolina, Presbyterian uh, uh, Seminary, um, and is one of the most renowned uh, scholars on the Old Testament, still living. Um, uh, and he's, he's really incredible, and he's writing a, a new book on narrative. Some of this writing shows up in his other works. I mean, if you're Brueggemann, and you've written as many books as, as he has, you only have so much to say. <laughs> so you start repeating yourself. But so he, he talks about totalizing narrative, and I think it's a really important theme to understand scripture. And so narrative, uh, Brueggemann borrows this idea from people like Bonhoeffer. Um, he borrows it from people in the confessing church who were struggling against Hitler. He also borrows it from um, the, um, um, what was the word? Uh, liberation theology, from both uh, black liberation theology in this country and from liberation theology in, um, in South America, in the Roman Catholic Church. So, um, Brueggemann argues that there is, exists a totalizing narrative in which nothing is allowed to exist outside of it. Imagine a narrative so large and all-consuming that nothing else exists. So, for example, the narrative of Pharaoh was one that there exists, that nothing exists outside of Egypt. In, in the Exodus story, Pharaoh is, is, Egypt is the center of the world. It's the center of the universe. It's the largest empire. Nothing exists outside of Egypt. And Pharaoh says to the people of Israel, if you leave and go into the desert, you'll die. So that's Pharaoh's totalizing narrative. And Brueggemann argues that totalizing narratives always begin the same way. The people who have the most develop anxiety anxiety about scarcity. So remember, how does Pharaoh's relationship with Joseph start? before his brothers end up in Egypt. What? Pharaoh has a dream. Does anyone remember what, what he dreams? Skinny cows eating a fat cows. He dreams that his cattle are dying. And the irony is that Pharaoh had more than anyone. He didn't need food. But he has a dream about his cattle dying. Greed, right? So, the, so anxiety about scarcity is how it begins. Second thing is abundance. And monopoly. And then violence. So, Exodus, Brigham would argue, is God's narrative. And God's narrative is always opposed. <laughs> To the totalizing narrative of scripture and of our world. So narr Pharaoh's narrative is nothing, ex nothing exists outside of Egypt. If you go into Egypt, you'll die. The irony is that it was in the wilderness that the people of Israel got to meet God. They saw the glory of God in the wilderness. They didn't die. So in some ways, uh, we can read the Gospels through the same lens, and I'll leave this for New Testament, but in some ways Jesus is the totalizing narrative to the Romans. So, for example, you hear the, the lesson of the, the feeding of the 5,000, and people say, well, that story's about, it's a, it's a miracle, and the story's also about maybe sharing. But I think about it in the context of, if you're writing in the context of the Roman Empire, where the Romans, first of all, we know they control the food supply, and they would often give out bread to pacify the people. And here you have a, a messianic figure who is feeding 5,000 people in the middle of nowhere. It must have made the Romans shake in their boots. It's, it, it was subversive in the same way that Brugon argues Exodus is subversive. So, um, so for example, um, and I, Brueggemann argues that 
in scripture, there always exists sort of competing narratives, right? So in Samuel, we have a story, I think it's Second Samuel, we have a story where the people of Israel are carrying the Ark of the Covenant to the temple, and it says they're slaughtering cattle and sheep and oxen, and that the blood is running down the steps of the temple. There's so much blood, they can't contain it, and they're worshiping God. And, and then it says in Samuel, when they get to the temple, they open up the, top, the ark, and all that is in there are two stone tablets. Stuck a knife right in it. So there's another narrative. There's a narrative in Scripture opposed to the same narrative, right? So God's requiring sacrifice, or is God requiring sacrifice? Um, so, for example, Isaiah 19, 18, if you have here... your Bibles. It is page 706. Um, on that day, there will be five cities in the land of Egypt that speak the language of Canaan. Swear loyalty to the Lord of heavenly forces. Swear loyalty to Yahweh. Right? One of them will be called the city of the sun. On that day, there will be an altar to Yahweh within the land of Egypt and a standing stone for Yahweh at its border. It will be a sign and witness to Yahweh of heavenly forces in the land of Egypt. When they cry out to Yahweh because of oppressors, God will send them a savior and defender to rescue them. Yahweh will make himself known to the Egyptians. The Egyptians will know Yahweh on that day. They will worship with sacrifices and offerings, making solemn promises to Yahweh and fulfilling them. Yahweh will strike Egypt, striking down and then healing. Striking and then healing. They will return to Yahweh, who will hear their pleas and heal them. On that day, this is the key part, on that day there will be a highway from Egypt to Assyria. The Assyrians will come to Egypt and the Egyptians to Assyria. And the Egyptians will worship with the Assyrians. On that day Israel will be a third, will be the third along with Egypt and Assyria. A blessing at the center of the world. The Lord of heavenly forces will pronounce his blessing. Bless Egypt, my people, and Assyria, my handiwork. And Israel, my inheritance. Isaiah is writing in a really, if, if we know the history, we know the context, and we know the early parts of Isaiah, Isaiah is writing in a context of arrogant Israel. We're the chosen people. We do what we want. God is on our side. Isaiah takes two pet names for Israel and applies them to Israel's enemies. To Assyria and to Egypt. The Lord of heavenly forces will pronounce this blessing, Bless Egypt, my people. Because Egypt, Yahweh's people. And Assyria, Yahweh's handiwork. That's an example of an opposing narrative within Scripture. Oh, I just, I have in my notes here. It was actually 1 Kings 8, when they had the, the cattle and the sheep. What is it? It actually says... Um, Thousands of cattle and sheep are slaughtered, and then the text says the only thing inside the ark was two, two stone tablets. So, I thought this was interesting. I know I'm glad Steve's not here because he would not be happy with me. But talking about the Sinai and Zion covenant, and going back to that, and then we're going to do it next to Jesus. Talk about Sinai and Zion covenant. We can actually see this in. Um, in the New Testament as well. Um, so, in Luke 16, right, you have the story of Lazarus and the rich man, mm -hmm. where Lazarus, Lazarus is sent into the bosom of Abraham, and the rich man asks the judge to send a mediator to warn his family. Right, they're they're both dead. And Lazarus had been begging on his doorstep, on the rich man's doorstep, the rich man wouldn't give him anything. So the rich man 
begs, and, and Jesus says the rich man had Moses and the prophets, and that's all he's going to get. So what's interesting about that narrative is the rich man is in Hades, right, begging for water first, then begging for a mediator, and Jesus says the rich man had Moses and the prophets. He knew to care for the poor. But where does Lazarus end up? In the bosom of Abraham. He gets the Zion covenant. The rich man got the Zion covenant. I thought he said something to the effect that if he didn't listen to Moses and the prophets, then he won't listen to you either if you went back. He does, he does say that. Oh, let's look at it. Luke 16. Abraham, okay, verse 25. But Abraham said, Child, remember that during your lifetime you received good things, whereas Lazarus received terrible things. Now Lazarus, Lazarus is being comforted, and you are in great pain. Moreover, um, let's see. No, 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 okay, let's get down to 20, 29. I was in the wrong place. Abraham replied, They have Moses and the prophets. They must listen to them. And the rich man had said, no, Father Abraham. So maybe that's an issue of translation, but I've heard that. I've read that too, just as you said it. But I think what's important here is that there seems to be a juxtaposition in the, in the, in the text, right? Abraham is somehow is given to, to Lazarus, but, but Moses is sort of associated with the rich man. I think this is an example of Jesus understanding the Sinai versus Zion covenant. Um, now, what we do with that, how that affects our soteriology, I, I don't know. But I think this is just an interesting thing that's happening in the text. Um, so, um, let's do an exegesis and see if we can do it. I don't know if we'll have time to do it, the small one group. So let's do one as a, as a large group. And this will probably be controversial. So let's just remember that we're always talking about people and not issues. As well. So let's look at Genesis Let's look at Genesis 19. story of Sodom. Who knows, what, what do you know about Sodom? Or at least what do people say about Sodom? Let's say that. Don't be afraid, this is going to be a sticky topic. They're naughty people. <laughs> okay. No, people say, like what I've heard, um, is that God, like God decides to burn down Sodom and Gomorrah because of sexual immorality. Okay. But spe okay, specifically we mean homosexuality. Yeah. Right. That's what's been applied. Right. Yep. Over time. Now let's not beat around the bush. So, so that's what we're talking about. Anything else about Sodom and Gomorrah? Okay. Let's. What? Oh, I was just going to say that um, they're surrounding the people in the house and they're basically commanding them to come out so they can have sex on So, rapists. Rapists? Good. Very good. Okay. So, um, so let's, let's, look at, let's look at the text. What we're going to do is we're going to be comparing two texts. And this is a perfect example of an exegesis because we're actually going to look at the text and see what does the text actually say. And then we're going to think about contemporary issues in our world. And then if we have time, we'll do a second one on violence. So, um, well, this is sexual violence, so we'll, this, this can work too. Um, 
Um, but a temporary issue in our world that I think all of our churches are, will deal with, um, that are probably personal to many of us. I'm sure we all have people in our, in our friends and family who this, at least this text has been used to personally harm, right? So let's look, let's actually look at the text. I think it's important if you want to be future leaders in the church to talk about this issue because this is coming down the pipe and it will affect every single church. All right. So verse 19, I mean chapter 19. Let's just go ahead and get right so God warns he's going to he's going to destroy Sodom. Um, Abraham pleads for Sodom. A lot is there as well. We some of us are we're, is anyone just completely unfamiliar with the story? Oh, okay. Well, let's um, let's then go ahead and start at 19. Anybody want to read 19, 1? Okay. The two messengers entered Sodom in the evening. No, messengers, uh, Hebrew, angels. Right? Two messengers entered Sodom in the evening. Lot was sitting at the gate of Sodom. Saw them, saw them got up to greet them, and bowed low. He said, Come to your servant's house, spend the night, and wash your feet. Then you can get up early and go on your way. But they said, No, we will spend the night in the town square. He pleaded earnestly with them, so they went with him and entered his house. He made a big meal for them, even baking unleavened bread, and they ate. Before they went to bed, the men of the city of Sodom, everyone from the youngest to the oldest, surrounded the house and called to Lot, Where are the men who arrived tonight? Bring them out to us, so that we may know them intimately. Lot went out toward the entrance, closed the door behind him, and said, My brothers, don't do such an evil thing. I've got two daughters who are virgins. Let me bring them out to you, and you may do to them whatever you wish. But don't do anything to these men, because they are now under the protection of my roof. They said, Get out of the way. And they continued, Does this immigrant want to judge us? Now we will hurt you more than we hurt them. They pushed Lot back and came close to breaking down the door. The men inside reached out and pulled Lot back into the house with them and slammed the door. Then the messengers blinded the men near the entrance of the house from the youngest to the oldest so that they groped around trying to find the entrance. So how does Lot, first of all, how does Lot treat the messengers? I think that's one thing we should think about. Very hospitable. Not necessarily hospitable towards his daughters, but he's hospitable towards his messengers. <laughs> it's almost like he treated the messengers with greater honor than his daughters. <laughs> Treats the messengers with more honor than his daughters. Yeah. What else do we notice? Either about Lot or about anything else? Now, I know we didn't cover this in the Levitical Code, we could have, but this is a huge theme in Judaism and in the Levitical Code. Honor to stranger, being hospitable. I mean, you would think that the Israelites were maybe Southerners, I don't know, but you have to feed people if they come to your house, you have to welcome them in. Jacob? There wasn't much like a vetting process or like questioning who these people are, they just kind of like, I don't know. That was really a nice thing to do for somebody you didn't really even try to investigate anything about. There's no vetting process for the strangers, right? Is that what you're saying? Yeah. <laughs> so it, there's sort of unconditional welcome of stranger, at least for a lot. Actually, that's my other question. Like, is he being like representative of the time, or is that just a lot thing to do? You know, I think that's a good question for us all to consider. I would, uh, yeah, I mean, personally, my own opinion is that Lot is sort of at this point representing an archetype of who Israel's called to be, or who the people, who, who, who faithful people to God are called to be, the unconditional welcome of a stranger. Um, and juxtaposing that to Sodom, so if we're juxtaposing Lot to Sodom, what are the men of Sodom, what, well, what's going on there?
demons? You said rage earlier. If, let's think about this for a second. If the men had come to the door and asked for the daughters instead of the messengers, who we assume are men, right? So the CB says men, but you know, I don't know what the Hebrew, Hebrew says. I, I'm curious, is it clear that the text says they're men, the messengers? So first of all, the messengers likely, if we're talking about angels, they're not even men anyway, they're angels. So, if they had asked to rape the daughters instead, and that's what we're talking about, we're talking about gang rape here, how would this change this story? Let's look at Ezekiel. Ezekiel 16 verses 48 through 50. Who, would someone please read that? Um, as surely as I live, says the, the Lord God, not even your sister Sodom and her daughters did what you and your daughters have done. This is the sin of your sister Sodom. She and her daughters were proud, had plenty to eat and enjoy peace and prosperity. But she didn't help the poor and the needy. They became haughty and did detestable things in front of me, and I turned away from them as soon as I saw it. So what's listed in Ezekiel as the sin of Sodom? Not helping the poor. Ambivalence to need, right? So how do we reconcile this? I mean, here the Bible clearly says that the sin of Sodom is not helping the poor and needy. But I thought the sin of Sodom was homosexuality. At least that's what the history of the church says. You said Lot was the archetype of what like, the good Israeli person is, right? So what if in that story the Sodomites are the archetype of what is like a sinful Israeli person is not? Or what a sinful person is, what an Israeli person is not? There we go. Right. Um, do you think that when he references Sodom, he might be, it might be a title for something else? In verse 53, it says, I will restore their fortunes, both the fortunes of Sodom and her daughters and the fortunes of Samaria and her daughters. And I will restore, restore their own fortunes in the midst that you may bear your disgrace and be ashamed of all that you have done, becoming a consolation to them. As for your sisters, Sodom and her daughters shall return to their former state. And Samaria and her daughters shall return to their former state, and your daughters shall return to your former state. Was not your sister Sodom a byword in your mouth in the day of your pride, before the, your weakness was uncovered? Um, I guess it goes on from there, but he talks about uh, Sodom being restored and prospering again, and returning to its former state, but it was barbecued. Right. Uh, um I don't know. Um, I don't know if it would be talking about something else, uh, but I'm also not certain that um, um, returning Sodom to its former state would be impossible. You know, I, I mean, I think if we're talking about sort of God's narrative here, of like for the example, the Isaiah, the Isaiah, Isaiah passage of establishing a highway between Israel and Syria, you know, of course that's absurd. It's a practical thing. 
um, in the same way that restoring Sodom is absurd because it doesn't exist. But it's a powerful theological truth that Ezekiel's trying to... Um, I would assume that if there's any variant in what Sodom would mean, some of our Bibles have a footnote. Does anyone have a footnote about the word? This one doesn't. Matter. I assume it's Sodom. It says Sodom. The context is the unfaithfulness of, I think, Judah and Israel. Right. So... So maybe the men of Sodom are the opposite. If Lot, if Lot is the archetype, archetype, Israelite, then maybe Sodom is the opposite of that. Um, I have no sort of um, agenda to how we sort of wrap this up in a nice neat little bow. But I think comparing these two texts is, is important. It's important because we talk about, about scripture always being in conversation, as we saw as I talked about earlier with the narrative thing with Walter Brueggemann. Um, it's important because, as I, just the question I posed, how would this story change had it been Lot's daughters they wanted instead of the men of this, instead of the messengers? In some ways, the story's about a gang rape, an unwelcome stranger. Um, so, what we aren't talking about here, at least it seems clear to me, but I'm welcome to engage in more conversation about what we're not talking about here is we're not talking about sexual orientation. We're not talking about two men or two women in faithful, committed, monogamous relationships. We're talking about gang rape. I have a friend who every time I call him, and he's with a bunch of people and he can't talk on the phone, he'll say, well, I don't want to sodomize these people, so I need to go. <laughs> Meaning he doesn't want to be inhospitable. What do y'all think? I'm curious. Push back. Seriously. I think it actually goes, I think they do go hand in hand here, the two different verses, because I was just re-looking at it. And if you look at it, it, it's specifying what they're going to do to the messengers. But the important part is is the fact that they're doing something inhospitable to the messengers. They're not being um, hospitable to them. And while over here it's talking about not helping the needy or the poor, it kind of goes hand in hand there too because they're not being hospitable to those who need them to be hospitable. Right. But people focus on the actual um, uh, homosexual act. However, that's not the point. It, you, it seems as if the point here is more of a respectful way of treating others, at least to me it seems. Yeah. Yeah, I think, well, I remember studying about Sodom and it just brought me back to the two scriptures in the New Testament where Sodom is actually referenced, um, and both references are talking about hospitality. Mm -hmm. um, and like Luke 10, 10, it says whenever you enter a city, and the people don't welcome you, go out into the streets and say, as a complaint against you, we brush off the dust of, our, of your city that has collected on our feet. But know this, God's kingdom has come to you. I assure you that Sodom will be better off on Judgment Day than that city. And the same thing is over in um, Matthew, and it's talking about any place that refuses you, that place is worse off than Sodom. So both references that I see in the New Testament to Sodom kind of talks about hospitality. Did you say the first one was in Matthew? I mean, Luke? Yeah, the first one, Luke 10, 10 through 11, and then Matthew 10, 14, which is, if anyone refuses to welcome you or listen to your words, shake the dust off your feet. As you leave that house or city, I assure you that it will be more bearable for the land of Sodom and Gomorrah on Judgment Day than it will be for that city. Any other thoughts? Thank you.
There's a scripture in Jude chapter, well, verse 7, that says, in a similar way, Sodom and Gomorrah and the surrounding towns gave themselves up to sexual immorality and perversion. They serve as an example of those who suffer the punishment of eternal fire. How does that fit in the whole of the picture? I would say that gang rape is sexual immorality. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I would say that gang rape is sexual immorality. And it, in some, the reason I wanted to pick out this particular piece is, first of all, it's contra these two. This piece of scripture is controversial. It's something that we don't talk about a lot. I don't know how much we're you're going to get to talk about it this weekend. Um, but as people who are going into future, who are thinking about ministry in the church in this context, it's important to explore this issue. It's important to especially explore um, sort of one commonly used piece of scripture. Um, now we could actually talk about the issue and go into the New Testament stuff um, and what Paul has to say, but that's, I'm not here teaching New Testament, we don't have time to do that. But, um, I think it's important to realize what's actually happening in the story, the issues of gang rape, the issues of inhospitality, and also what Ezekiel says about Sodom's sin. Um, and also realizing the context, going back to what we talked about last in the last section, uh, section about context and language. What we're absolutely not talking about here is sexual orientation. So that's a, that's a different, different conversation. Um, I wish we had time for our other exegesis, which was I thought was going to be pretty good, which was about um, um, Isaiah. They will beat their swords into plowshares, and then in Joel, where it says absolutely the opposite, they'll beat their plowshares into swords. So I want us to exegete those two seemingly conflicting passages in their context and then probably and then talk about how we could relate that to issues in our modern world around violence. Um, I've been particularly thinking of what's been happening in Baltimore and North Charleston and Ferguson. And so, um, but unfortunately we didn't get time to do this, so maybe you can talk about that during ethics and social justice. <laughs>